Welcome to Realty Talk, the show that brings together the country's most authoritative and respected property experts. Follow us on all the socials and subscribe for updates and exclusive offers. Realty Talk is powered by realty.com.au, connecting buyers, sellers and agents differently. Hi and welcome to this week's Realty Talk show. Your property hubs go to home for property investment insights, inspiration and stories from Australia's top property experts, leaders and analysts. I'm your anchor, Bushy Martin from Nihau Property Finance. And this week, we break with show tradition to focus on the latest potential fiasco that surfaced in the Sunshine State, flying, flying from the Queensland Premier's recent brain fart, suggestion of introducing rental caps. To balance the discussion, the Chair of Pippa, Nicola McDougall, joins us to unpack the potentially disastrous impacts that would flow from imposing rental caps and their negative ripple effects on rental supply, tenants, and the state economy generally, leading to a quite entertaining Freudian slip that uh, coins the rather appropriate term rental crap. So make sure you listen out for that. And to round out the show, Kevin Turner continues our special series on the art of negotiation with buyer's agent Kane Bakos, who reveals the different method, methods that agents use with multiple offers. Now, before we get underway, if you're enjoying the show, I want to thank you again for tuning in and I would need to ask you another very small favour that will have a massive impact because we really need your help in order to continue to attract great guests and enjoy great conversations. Can I ask, ask you to hit the like button and the subscribe button wherever you're listening to or watching the show because we're on a mission to get to 1 million subscribers and by helping me to help you together, we're going to help those that are less fortunate that have no voice and have no choice. Because for every new subscriber, together, we're going to save lives. Because we'll donate a day's worth of life-saving water to families in Tigray, Ethiopia. So do everyone a massive favour and make a difference by taking a couple of seconds to subscribe now. And make sure you also sign up on the realty.com.au homepage, where you'll also get a free copy of my award-winning book, Get Invested, just for making the effort. We've got some very engaging and quite entertaining info to share. So let's get underway. Property deductions can save you thousands of dollars each year. To make sure you maximise deductions, you need to work with the most experienced quantity surveyor in the country. BMT Tax Depreciation is the leading specialist in the industry. They've completed over 700,000 tax deduction schedules for residential investment and commercial properties Australia-wide. BMT guarantee to find double your fee in the first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Now, it doesn't matter where you turn, it feels like everyone and everything is dominated by doomsday discussions on the national housing crisis, housing affordability, and the rental crisis. And while it may appear to be a sudden, unexpected phenomena, for many of us who've been in the industry for a long time, our current housing woes have been decades in the making for a lack of property strategic planning and proactive action by the public sector at all levels. But unfortunately, in our myopic, instant iPhone reactive world that's dominated by short-term, ill-conceived, knee-jerk reactions that lack any long-term vision, where the squeaky wheels are the ones that get all of the oil, our politicians appear to be hell-bent on coming up with overnight band-aid solutions that are all aimed at convenient scapegoats. And in the property arena, the punching bag is always the silent majority of hard-working mum and dad property investors. Recent cases in point include the Queensland Greens harebrained rental freeze proposal, a failed attempt to increase land tax in Queensland for interstate investors, moved by some councils to restrict the number of nights an investor can rent out their property as a short-term Airbnb, and the federal government's latest damaging foray into the suggestion of taxing unrealised gains on superannuation accounts above a certain level. But it doesn't end there, because the latest poorly conceived and naive attempts at reactive policy on the fly that's likely to make things far worse for everyone rather than better, is the Queensland Government's latest move to impose residential rental caps on landlords that's likely to have flow-on effects across the country if this mad proposal actually gets up. So to put some balance back into the discussion on this quite critical issue, we're joined by the Chair of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia, Nicola McDougall. So welcome back to Realty Talk, Nicola. Thanks, Bushy, for having me in what has been quite a busy week. I could well imagine it's uh, never a dull day in the uh, property game, as we both know. 
But uh, Nick, on this particular subject, to sort of set the context, if we can, what's what's the sort of current situation in relation to the treatment of rent variations in Queensland and other parts of the country? Well, I think there, I mean there is some divergence, you know, in the in the legislation depending on which state and territory you, you're in. I mean, but generally speaking, um, there's a few territories and states that already have. Uh, limits on the number of times that you can increase rent per year, and that's generally about twelve months. I, I will, I will preference with all of this though, with the fact that any any type of rent increases or things like that have to be in the agreement to start off with. So you know, generally, you know, it's not just sort of turning up one day and you're finding out about it for the first time. Um, and obviously, there's notice periods and things like that. Um, so in, in plenty of other states, um, that is already the situation. Certainly, um, I think South Australia, New South Wales, and various other places. Um, uh, Queensland, uh, Western Australia, I believe, you know, we've probably been the outliers on here in Queensland where um, there hadn't been a limit on the number of times um, Technically speaking, I mean, although in Queensland you can't do it more, any more than six months. Um, so that that was the situation here in Queensland. Obviously, last week we heard from the Queensland Pre uh, 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 Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk. Um, it just, it, I love the term thought bubble. Um, a lot of people are calling a thought bubble because it kind of, you know, took us all by surprise uh, last week where she suggested that the, that the state government was considering uh, rent caps. But what was really concerning at the point at that point was that she didn't actually divulge what that meant. And obviously rent caps can mean a number of things, including obviously rental controls and freezes on the amount that you can actually increase um, rent. But since then, we've learned seemingly that's that, that's not what she meant. Um, and that they were only considering the actual, you know, reduction of um, the number of times that you could increase um, a rent in a tenancy. Okay, well, some would say uh, thought bubble, others would say brain, brain fart. I think uh, Nick I was trying to be polite. Putting it fairly crudely uh, in the context of it, but uh, and I know it's still uh, up in the air and in abeyance. Mm. Uh, uh, but you know, in addition to the the sort of fairly uh, limp wristed. Uh, retreat, I guess, in terms of just looking at the uh, once a year increase. Yes. Uh, what else was thrown up in the air in relation to the Queensland government pr proposal around the whole rental situation? No, well, I think, you know, obviously, you know, uh, Queensland's been classified as the second worst uh, place for renters in the country, the second least affordable place in the country. Um, as we've talked about several times before, Bushy, uh, this didn't happen overnight, uh, has been building for years and years and years. Look, next year, you could easily say it's been building for 10 years uh, yeah. since the APRA changes first started happening back then. Yeah. Um, clearly, we had a reduction in the number of investors. And in Queensland, of course, we have a higher percentage of renters and a higher, you know, a lot of interstate investors as well, historically speaking. Um, so what we saw was, you know, up until COVID, uh, falling number of investors um, who are being active in the market, that's reducing supply. Then obviously, as we saw in 2021 um, and in our wonderful Pippa investment, Investor Sentiment Survey last year, um, you know, saw that a staggering 45% of investors had sold at least one property in the previous two years to make mo to make the most of rising market conditions. Because pre-COVID, as someone who has their whole portfolio in the southeast corner, it was very flat. It was woeful. And rents were going backwards. No one seems to talk about that. You know, I had a property where when I first bought it, the rent was four sixty five. And then just um, it only recently got to 500 and I've had that property for 10 years. But during the ensuing years, at one point, it was 380. So it went backwards. And it's only now 10% higher than what it was 10 years ago. Um, but anyway, that's just me sort of saying people need to look at what the history of, of the situation certainly here in Queensland has been. Um, for investors, because it has been pretty dire. And the reason why it was pretty dire was that um, our economy, our state economy, under which the current state uh, premier has been the premier for the entire time, um, was underwhelming and underperforming. Um, and if you have that, well, then the, the property market generally is is, is the same. Um, <clears throat> so that was what happened. We've seen, you know, a huge volume of investors uh, exit the market, a huge volume of, of investors um, prior to COVID, 
COVID not entering the market. And then what we've had again since rates started rising in May is another huge volume of investors not being able to get into the market. Um, so there you go. What's What do they call it in the Olympics? Three-peat um, of woe. Uh, so that's where we're at. And there is, is you know, a, a simple case of not enough um, supply for the demand that we have, um, which has sent uh, rents skyrocketing. Uh, and it must be said that rent started strengthening before rates started increasing, and they started strengthening um, a lot well before the floodgates of overseas migrants came in as well. Of course. Now, uh, we may have averted the the ultimate, but in, in the unlikely case that there's a rear guard action and, and some sort of rental crap, uh, rental mm. cap, it's probably, <laughs> probably the right, that's probably the right word, actually, but it uh, was an action. Can, can we leave that in? Bit of a Freudian slip there. What what impacts will that have across the board, including for investors, property values, rental supply, and renters themselves, as you see it? So it certainly sounds likely after the um, they're having another housing housing affordability powwow today. Um, again, Pippa didn't get a seat at that table, which is somewhat perplexing. Mm. Um, however, it does certainly sound like the the, the, the you know Queensland government is um, bringing in you know those rental caps of you know maximum increase of once a year. I don't know about you, Bushy, but I know about me as a long term investor. I have never put my rent up more than once a year. Um, so it does seem like, you know, populist politics, a bit of tokenism. Oh, we have to be seen to be doing something. Um, look, in, in a way, it, it's kind of a, a little absurd because obviously we have seen, um, you know, a, a, a staggering increase in expenses for investors. Uh, yep. Pippa and, and Picker, actually, the Property Investors Council of Australia, recently did a survey together, which we released to the media yesterday, which really showed, you know, that, that increasing financial impost on investors. Some of them are really struggling with their mortgage repayments while still being fair and reasonable to their tenants because they want a long-term tenant, right? Yeah. Um, so what we'll see, I suppose, when this comes in, and I don't know what date that would be, uh, if you're only allowed to put the rent up once per year, well, it will probably, if people have to put it up by a certain amount uh, to cover their massive increase in costs, that might be a big jump. Um, and it's not being greedy. It's about the fact that, you know, my mortgage has doubled in the last 12 months and I haven't actually put up my, I might have only put up my my rent on my properties by a small amount or whatever. And if you've only got one shot at it, um, it's actually going to make renting more of unaffordable uh, yeah. for the next year. Um, yeah. So there's that. Obviously, look, from a policy point of view, other states and territories already do it. Um, as an industry, we can we can live with that, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's the lesser of two evils. Obviously, last week when um, there was that that thought bubble or brain fart, as you said, um, we were concerned that she was going to actually bring in uh, either rent freezes or some type of caps on the amount of rent that you could actually uh, increase um, on your property, such as there is an ACT um, yeah. already, which is kind of absurd, really, because you think about it. You know, you can't put you can't put the rent up more than ten percent above CPI, and and you know that's very rare that you would even be in that ballpark anyway. Um, so in regards to that, that was clearly you know that would be decimating to the to the investment um, market to be terrible for renters. Uh, supply would dwindle, rents would soar. Um, so thankfully, that appears to be off the table at the moment. Yep. Um, and. From what I've learned over the last couple of days, um, it does sound like that the government um, is really prioritising trying to increase the supply um, of properties out there. Clearly, none of this happens overnight. We're talking about many years down the road, but at least they're finally, look, they'll never own up to the fact that part of the reason for the problem is that they have... Um, <clears throat> They have, you know, um, totally reduced the volume of social housing that they provide to their citizens. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the numbers are. I think it used to be about 15% of all housing stock and it went down to 3% because wow. us private investors, we were doing the heavy lifting um, whilst also getting slugged with, you know, taxes and various things all the time as well. So whilst, you know, it'll be a cold, you know, what was the, what's that, a cold day in hell or a hot day in hell, whichever yep. the way it goes, um, when they go, oh, sorry, we should have been building more social housing for our residents, they'll never say that, but at least they are actually, by the sound of it, doing something about addressing that massive shortfall that we have because private investors can't, we, it's not our role 
to provide social housing, um, but it has been it's become our role because the government's just stopped doing it. Absolutely right. So uh, in a perfect world then, uh, what are your thoughts on alternatives to improve the current broken system for both renters and landlords alike as you see it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, um, as an investor myself, as the chair of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia, um, we should be encouraging um, Australians to invest in residential property, um, not only for their own um, ability to improve their financial future and hopefully not have to rely on the pension in retirement, but at the end of the day, we all know the stats, the vast majority of investors only own one property and a few more own two. Um, at the moment, you know, many of them are not buying uh, because they physically can't get the finance. They're not buying because perhaps they bought a really crap first investment property because they used the, they, you know, went out on their own or perhaps they got advice from someone who didn't actually know what they were talking about. Yeah. Um, so I would like to see some type of incentives, which whatever way they might look to help more investors back into the market. I think also what's happened over the last few years, and, you know, Bushy, I've been on the board now for 10 years, or 10 years next year. Right. Um, yep. I think about all of the levers that have been pulled in that time, all the policy changes that have come and go, come and gone in that time. Some have stuck, some have been axed. Um, negative gearing, capital gains tax, discount always on the chopping board, always a political football. Then yeah. we have, you know, APRA changes and then, you know, uh, the stupid, in, you know, the interstate and Queensland land tax last year, um, changing rental tenancy legislation around the country where investors are feeling like they've lost control of their assets. All of these things are happening. All the, Honestly, it makes your head spin. Yep. And when you're thinking about buying a property with a long-term mindset, because that's what you need to do, yep. there's so much ammunition being thrown at you all the time that I can understand why so many investors are either A, hesitant to get into the market at all, or B, are actually keen to exit it. Because it's hardly the domain of like, you know, we talk about buying property and it's a it's a stable performer and it is it is over the long term but the system that it operates in isn't yeah. and it's it's just there's it's just too much and i think everybody is just getting over it you know just to use that term everyone's just a bit over it and um when you see just you know as i said all of these policies come and go and you know it's like getting the rug pulled out from you and i feel this at the moment obviously i'm quite passionate about it today because um, the last week, this is generally what, what I've been working on, um, and it just has a sense of deja vu, not just about the land tax last year, but about negative, about all the campaigns that I've been involved in during my career, including at the REIQ. So we're talking about 17 years. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of feel kind of tired. Yeah, I can from it, of it, you know, yeah. and I just and I just kind of, oh no, not again, not like not this shit again, because that's what it's like, and because it's that all they're doing is going, oh well, this will win us some few few voters, and they're not worrying about the impact that it has, um, whether it ends up becoming true or not, or they, they, they you know it becomes actual law or not, they're not worrying about or they don't care about the impact that it has on investors or even on renters and on homeowners. They don't care, you know, and I just feel very tired about it all. <laughs> yeah, it's a good I do. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a, a ooh, exhausted giggle, I suppose, but it's, it's how I really feel because, mm. you know, when we won the land tax, when we helped to win the land tax camp, uh, fight last year, I said at the time, you know, to a lot of people, I said, you know, this won't, this is not our last, not our first rodeo and it won't be our last, unfortunately. And here we are and it's not even six months since that was repealed. Exactly right. So I, I guess then, uh, being that a lot of us are war weary as a consequence <laughs> of this whole exercise, it, yeah. what can we do individually and collectively to kill off this sort of crazy proposal stuff arising again in the future? Yeah, I mean, oh, oh God, I mean, obviously, it's you know about um, uh, from a professional point of view, from an industry point of view, belonging to your industry associations, not just Pippa, 
but obviously, you know, maybe your state and territory uh, institutes and other aligned industry associations and collective voices are the ones that can make change. And we certainly <clears throat> saw that last year. We certainly saw that the negative gearing campaign in the 2019 federal election, of which I was happy to be a part of with Peter Kalisos and the wider industry. Yeah. Um, so it's about, you know, um, <laughs> joining your association, supporting us, supporting us to do our job, which is to protect the interests of our members, but also to protect consumers, because as we as we saw on the Four Corners show last night, you know, there's no regulation to really do that as it is. Um, so it's all fair and good to sit back and, and kind of let us all fight these fights for you. But I would love, to, I mean, obviously, the Pippa is growing you know, strength by strength by strength. You know, our association is is amazing now and continuing to grow. But yeah. you know, there's still a huge cohort of people out there that are riding on our coattails, I suppose. And people like yourself and me and many many people that I'm standing on, on the shoulders of from years before, who have put in time and effort and our membership fees. I mean, even myself on the board, all the board of volunteers, yeah. um, you know, we're all doing this for the betterment of everybody in the industry. So that, and I think well, that's the important thing to say, um, <clears throat> regardless of the outcome of today, um, we have to get ready uh, because, you know, this won't be the last rodeo, but we do have obviously federal election, not not too far away. Um, and we do need to have the collective voice of across our whole industry um, to be able to uh, represent our industry more thoroughly um, and also to be able to provide consumer prote protections. Because if we have more people who are members of PIPA, then uh, consumers are going to use someone who actually is, you know, licensed, experienced, qualified to give them talent and, you know, independent advice. Yeah, no, extremely well said. And uh, I, I really want to thank you for coming on. I know how busy you are and uh, it's great for you to highlight and balance the discussion on these really important issues, Nicola. And thanks again for your valuable time on the show today. Thanks, Bushy. Thanks, Nicola. Well, as you can hear yet again, villainising and penalising hardworking mum and dad investors as the cause of all of our business housing issues is a best misinformed and a worst downright dangerous. For those inside and outside of government that have been calling for such crazy schemes as rental caps, you need to answer this really key question. How is reducing investor demand and the resulting reduction in rental housing supply going to improve the situation for Queenslanders and beyond that if it goes further? Because there's no doubt that rental caps will further reduce the number of rental properties as many current investors will bail and potential investors won't buy property in Queensland because they can't trust the state government to allow a free market to operate. And this in turn is going to mean that people will stop moving to the Sunshine State because there's nowhere to live, which means businesses won't be able to attract staff. And this will all mean that the Queensland economy and locals will be the biggest losers. So why cut up your nose to spite your face? It almost feels as though ill-informed, short-sighted governments have become like the tadpoles of cannibalistic cane toads who turn on and eat each other in an attempt to survive, only to make things worse and put the entire survival of the ecosystem at risk. Instead, it's time for governments at all levels to stop the ill-informed scapegoating and reactive band-aiding. Instead, step up, show some real leadership and long-term vision, and take some real responsibility by taking the action required to increase the supply of housing. And this includes incentivising rather than penalising mum and dad investors by embracing them as their best friends and stop treating them like their worst enemies. For more on this, have a read of the great articles on pippa.asn.au. Make sure you join the Property Investment Council of Australia or PICA if you're an investor to ensure your voice gets heard. And if you're a property professional, make sure you become a PIPA member. And we look forward to seeing you at the very first inaugural PIPA conference on Friday the 22nd of September in Sydney. And I need to remind you straight up that tickets are limited, so make sure you secure your ticket now. Stay with us for more on your Property Hub's go-to place for all things property, here on Realty Talk. Successful property investment is a game of finance. Do you have the right team and the right game plan? Realty Talk is brought to you by Know How Property. More than mortgage brokers, Bushy Martin and his team of investment architects set you up with a sustainable strategy structured to lower your costs, tax, risk and stress while increasing your capacity for growth. Know How has helped over 1,900 homeowners and investors secure more than $800 million in property wealth. 
So get set to live more, work less, and live your legacy. Want to know how to invest in your freedom? Visit knowhowproperty.com.au. As one of Australia's most outstanding buyers agents, Kate Bacos has a wealth of knowledge and experience when it comes to helping families secure their dream home or the perfect property to add to their investment portfolio. So who better to talk to about successful negotiation? And this time I talked to Kate about the different methods agents use with multiple offers. That's up next. Property depreciation is the natural wear and tear of a building and its assets. Property investors can claim depreciation as a tax deduction each financial year. Depreciation is a non-cash deduction. This means you don't need to spend any money in order to claim it. On average, BMT tax depreciation find residential investors almost $9,000 in first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Oh, it's such a dilemma as a buyer when an agent says to you that you're in competition and there are multiple offers. How do you believe them? Do you believe them? Kate Bacos is my guest. So I'm going to pose that question to you, Kate, because you obviously get that quite often, I would imagine, as a buyer's agent. How, how do you handle that? It is a tough one because if you're the only buyer, you might be reacting with a, a, a fear of missing out. Yeah. But if you want to try and call the agent's bluff, you might actually miss out. So I always consider that there's a very high chance that they're being honest about multiple buyers or at least mm. another buyer. Mm. Yeah, you've got to really treat it that way, don't you? Otherwise, you will run the risk of it. And I guess the bottom line is, Kate, just knowing how far you're prepared to go and at yeah. what point are you prepared to put your best foot forward? You're absolutely right. There's a thing called social proof, which is an ability for a buyer to see others fighting for the same property. And that often spurs on buyers to, to give it their best shot or to stretch themselves. And the absence of social proof can sometimes have them wondering whether they should even be making an offer on a property. So this um, psychological barrier can strike many times. But what I always say to people, whether we've got a, a multi offer situation or whether they're the only person on the property, they need to understand what it's worth to them, how frequently this type of property comes up, because if it's an infrequent property and it's a very special and well-suited property for them, they really need to think about the cost of missing out as well, because if it takes another six months in a moving market, it, they might regret not putting their best foot forward. But ultimately, knowing your values really helps you face this challenge. So when, an, when there is a multi-offer situation, the agent comes to you and says, look, I need to tell, disclose this to you. And they say, my advice is to put your best and final offer in. In other words, indicating that, you know, if you get beaten, I'm not going to come back to you. Mm. Where, where does that leave you? Well, it, it leaves a lot of people feeling pretty anxious about the situation because mm. no one wants to win a property by forty or fifty thousand dollars and no one wants to miss a property for a thousand dollars. So where is that that in between that they're comfortable with? And transparency usually solves that issue. But then you get people saying, Oh, I don't like an auction or I don't want a Zoom auction or a boardroom auction. So mm -hmm. Having, having the chance to put their best foot forward, it can sometimes go well for someone who's looking at a property that is potentially a little bit better than they thought their budget could afford them. When you put everything that you've got on the table, you've got no regrets. If it goes your way, it can be a fantastic thing. And if it doesn't, you're not too devastated because you were prepared for it. Mm -hmm. But it's when you've got the budget that could purchase the property or you've, you've even got surplus budget, that's where you've got to work out, where do I stop? And that question, where do I stop, is a function of what the property's true value is, and like I said before, how scarce it is. And also, having a look at, on the market at properties in higher price points, asking yourself, at what point, at, at what level could I be getting a higher quality property? Yeah, my, my advice to buyers has always been, if you're looking at a contract and it has, say, 550000 on it from you, and the agent is indicating that you need to pay more, you have to ask yourself, if if the agent called me tomorrow and told me that this house had sold for 555,000, 5,000 over what I was prepared to, how would I feel? Yeah. And if you feel 
bad about that, then maybe you should consider paying that. That, yeah. that, that, that. That's a bit of a test as to whether there's any more in me. Yes, that's a really good point, Kevin. And you've also touched on something that, that I always remind buyers of, and that is round figures. If you're going into this scenario, you need to assume that a lot of other people will be thinking around figures as well. Mm-hmm. And sometimes just having a little bit of a quirky figure, a tad higher than the round figure. So in this situation, it might have been, you know, 556. Or if you're thinking that you're quite comfortable with the idea of going in at 560, you might do 561. Always bear in mind when a vendor is sitting with their agent at the end of that opportunity, they'll be looking at all of the price points and sometimes they'll just pick the one that was $1,000 above another. Is there a requirement from an agent to, well, obviously they need to disclose if you're in competition so that you, it's not a surprise, but is there a requirement for them to get something in writing that they have actually advised the buyer that that's the case? That's a good question. Some states require that. In Victoria, we sometimes have uh, a, a document that's accompanied with the contract stating that the the purchaser accepts that they're entering into one of these scenarios where there's multiple buyers but no there's not legislation around that in my state yeah because i think sometimes agents will use that as a bit of a lever with the seller to say well look i've been back to all of these buyers and they've signed this form to say this is their best and final offer there is nothing left in them at this stage yes. so there's it there's a lot of um A lot of ground to be covered in some of these issues, Kate, isn't it? It's really difficult because I think we need to understand that sometimes buyers will only ever buy one or two houses in their entire life and it can be very, very frightening. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin, you're right. And knowledge is power when you've done your analysis or you're well aware of other properties that have recently sold that compare to the one that you're interested in, it can really help. Okay, just before we leave this uh, this segment, can I just ask you, you know, we had touched on it there about agents disclosing to a buyer what are the different methods they use yeah and i it's important to note that agents set the tone here they they write their own rules for how they want to which method they want to adopt and how they deal with buyers in these situations because auctions are governed by legislation but private sales there's lots of different ways they can choose to do it and they can switch up and make a change from maybe an expression of interest to something transparent. So it it is up to the agent how they like to do this. But some of the ways that they deal with competitive buyers, uh, firstly, if it's transparent, they can do a simulated auction. That might be in their boardroom or it could be on Zoom where all of the people can see each other and they go up in increments of, let's say, $500 or $1,000 until one person's left. Other times they, they may go backwards and forwards on the phone. So they're making phone calls until uh, late in the night until, again, one person is left standing. But if they're dealing with buyers who might have different conditions and different settlement dates and different deposit sizes, that's usually when they do best and highest because best and highest is really at the, the vendor's discretion. They'll be weighing up all of those offers and the terms and the conditions and they'll, they'll make a decision for the offer that's most suited to them. And it's not always the highest offer. Mm. I want to ask you next time we get together, Kate, about uh, expressions of interest. And, you know, I know that, that that's a temptation from buyers who want to stick their toe on the water and say, well, look, let, let's just see if they'd be interested rather than me making an offer, just an expression of interest. So we'll cover that next time. Kate Bakos is a buyer's agent and my guest on this series of negotiation tips. Kate, thanks for your time. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Kevin. And that's another wrap for this week's show. Another special thanks to our guests, Nicola McDougall and Kate Bakos. And before we go, make sure you don't miss another episode of your trusted voice for all things property by subscribing to the Property Hub and on your favourite podcast player now, where you'll also enjoy the Get Invested podcast delivered to you each and every week. Thanks again to Realty.com.au, BMT Tax Depreciation, Apiro Marketing, DM Media and Southern Cross Stereo for their ongoing support. I'm Bushy Martin from Know How Property Finance, and along with Kevin Turner and the entire Property Hub Realty Talk team, we thank you for getting invested in yourself by investing in us. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Miss something in this week's show or want to catch up on past shows? Do it anytime at realty.com.au where we connect buyers, sellers and agents differently. 